In this video, we're going to talk about the sliding filament theory of skeletal muscle contraction. Now, I know this is a particularly difficult topic, so we're going to break it down and go through each of the stages. So let's make a start. We've got a little activity to begin with, just as a reminder of the structure of a sarcomere. So we can label all of the different bands and zones and check that we're happy with that. So let's do that together. So number one, this would be the sarcomere because it's labeling this whole section from Z line to Z line with the actin and myosin filaments. So that whole section would be called a sarcomere. And obviously sarcomeres are all next to each other, making up what we call the myofibrils in the muscle fibers. Number five is a Z line. And you've got another Z line over here and they mark the ends of the sarcomeres. Then you've got number two, which is the A band, because you can see number two is the length of the myosin filaments. So that is what we call the A band. And then number three are the I bands. Now the I bands consist of actin only. So the I bands will appear lighter under the microscope because actin is thin. And in the I bands, there's only actin, thin filaments. So it's going to appear lighter. In the center of the A band, you've got a region known as the H zone. Now the H zone is where you've got myosin only. So have a look with me. It's myosin only with no overlapping actin. So the difference between the A band and the H zone is the A band is the full length of the myosin filament. So you've got some myosin overlapping with actin and some myosin only in the middle. And the H zone is just the myosin only bit in the middle of that A band. And then we've got the filaments themselves. So seven, that's the myosin, which is the thicker protein filament. So wherever there's myosin, it's gonna look darker under the microscope. And six is the thinner actin. And remember, actin only makes up those I bands. So what's gonna happen when the sarcomere, um, or when the muscle fiber contracts, what's gonna happen to the sarcomere? Well, if you can picture contraction, yeah, you can kind of picture what's going to happen. So we could say things like the sarcomere gets shorter. And obviously the Z lines get closer together. But thinking about what happens to the I bands, the H zone and the A band can be a little bit more confusing. And um, the H zone gets shorter. And this is because the actin filaments are going to slide inwards. So you're going to have less of that section in the middle where there's myosin only because the actin filaments are going to have more overlap with the myosin. So the H zone gets shorter. The I band gets shorter as well. And again, that's for the same reason. It's because the actin filaments are sliding inwards or being pulled inwards over the myosin. So you're going to have less of this kind of actin only region or the I band gets shorter. And then the A band stays the same. It's the only one that stays the same. And the reason it stays the same is because the A band is the length of the myosin filament. And that does not change. All that's happening is the actin is sliding inwards over the myosin. But the length of the myosin filament stays the same. So the A band stays the same. And I remember that because there's an A in the word same. So that reminds me it's the A band that stays the same. Everything else gets shorter. So that should not be too difficult. Let's think about how the muscle actually contracts. Now we're gonna start right from the beginning and go through the whole story. So you'll know that when the muscle fiber is stimulated, the action potential passes along the sarcolemma, which is just the muscle fiber cell membrane. And that action potential is going to be transmitted down the T-tubules or the transverse tubules, and it's going to be transmitted deep into the muscle fibers. Now, remember, this is the result of um, an action potential being generated in the muscle fiber. And that's the result of kind of the neuromuscular junction, which we filmed in a previous video. So do check that out. You've got acetylcholine diffusing across the synaptic cleft. It binds to its receptors on the sarcolemma, causing sodium ions to diffuse in to the muscle fiber, which depolarizes the sarcolemma and leads to that generation of the action potential, which then travels down the transverse tubules and deep into the muscle fibers. So this story kind of links with that video that I've already posted 
on neuromuscular junctions. So if that is confusing you, check out that video as well for me, okay? But what we've got now is the action potential traveling down the T-tubules deep into the muscle fibers. Now the action potential is then carried to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum in a muscle fiber stores calcium ions. And when the action potential reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's gonna cause the release of those calcium ions or CA2 plus into the myofibrils. So the calcium ions are being released. You can kind of see it on the diagram here. They're being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into, yeah, into the myofibrils where we find those actin and myosin filaments. So let's continue. What are those calcium ions gonna do once they've been released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the myofibrils. Well, they're gonna to bind to troponin. Now, troponin is a protein that you don't need to actually know the name of for AQA, but I always teach it because it makes the story make sense. Now, troponin, if you look at the diagram here, is a globular protein, and troponin is attached to another fibrous protein called tropomyosin, and tropomyosin is the red line that you can see here that is wrapped around the actin, the actin filament. So you've got three proteins. You've got the actin filaments themselves, you've got tropomyosin that's wrapped around the actin, and you've got the globular troponin attached to the tropomyosin. Now you don't have to know the name troponin, so if you're doing AQA biology, you can just say the calcium ions bind to tropomyosin. That would be absolutely fine. But I'm gonna teach the full story. So the calcium ions bind to troponin, and then troponin changes shape. And this causes the tropomyosin to move aside. Because when the calcium ions bind to troponin, the troponin changes shape in such a way that it kind of pulls on the tropomyosin and the tropomyosin gets shifted or moved aside. And once that tropomyosin is moved aside, it's going to expose the binding sites on the actin for the myosin heads. So when the muscle is at rest or when it's relaxed, the tropomyosin is blocking those binding sites on the actin. But when the calcium ions bind to troponin and the tropomyosin moves aside, we're going to now expose those binding sites on the actin for the myosin heads. Now, the myosin heads can now bind to the actin, or we can say actin myosin cross bridges form. Okay, so these are the myosin heads, the kind of bulbous heads that are sticking out from the myosin filaments. And those bulbous heads are going to be able to attach to the actin at one of those myosin head binding sites. And we can call that an actin myosin cross bridge. So once we've got the actin myosin cross bridge, now we can get contraction of that muscle fiber and the sarcomeres are going to shorten. So let's think about how that happens. So the actin filaments are going to move inwards, or you can say they're going to be pulled inwards over the myosin filaments in what is known as the power stroke. So the myosin head, I feel like I need to act this out. The myosin head is going to attach to the actin and it's going to pull or move the actin filaments inwards over the myosin filaments. And you can see that happening here. So at the top, You've got a couple of sarcomeres here in a myofibril that is relaxed. And at the bottom, you've got the same couple of sarcomeres in a, in a, in a muscle fiber that is contracted. So you can see the Z lines have moved closer together. You can see that the I bands have got shorter. You can see the H zone has got shorter, but the A band obviously stays the same length because it's just the length of the myosin filament, which does not change, okay? But we're going to say the actin filaments are pulled or moved inwards over the myosin filaments. You can say this is known as the power stroke. Okay, now we need to mention ATP because we haven't mentioned it yet, but I've purposefully left it till the end. So hopefully it makes sense.
once this has happened, so once the actin filaments have been pulled over the myosin filaments in an inward direction, an ATP molecule is then going to bind to the myosin head. And when the ATP molecule binds to the myosin head, it causes the actin-myosin crossbridge to break. Or you can say when the ATP binds, it causes the myosin head to detach from the actin. So you're breaking that cross bridge when the ATP molecule binds or you're detaching the myosin head from the actin. The ATP is then hydrolyzed into ADP and PI, adenosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate. And that will reset or bend the myosin head back into its original position. And then it will be able to bind again further up the actin filament, forming another actin-myosin crossbridge. Okay, and this is basically going to continue as long as there is ATP available to bind to the myosin head, break the actin-myosin crossbridge, reset the myosin head. As long as there's ATP available, and as long as there are calcium ions in the myofibril, then this is going to continue with the actin filaments being pulled inwards over the myosin filaments. That's why it's called the sliding filament theory. Okay, let's have a think about after contraction. So after contraction has occurred, we need to know that the calcium ions are rapidly pumped or actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So they're being removed from the myofibrils and actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum for storage. Obviously, this also uses ATP. So that's another use of ATP after contraction. And when that happens, when the calcium ions leave the myofibrils and are pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the myosin binding sites on the actin filaments are blocked again by tropomyosin as tropomyosin covers the binding sites again. So the tropomyosin is going to move back into its original position because there's no calcium ions anymore bound to the troponin. When the tropomyosin moves back to its original position, it's going to cover the binding site on the actin for the myosin heads. The muscle relaxes, the sarcomere lengthens again. So the sarcomeres lengthen, the Z lines get further away, the I bands lengthen and the H zone lengthens. Obviously the A band stays the same because it's the length of the myosin filaments, which does not change. Right, the importance of ATP then. This is something that always trips up students. What do you actually say about why we need ATP for muscle contraction? So the things that I will focus on, ATP binds to the myosin heads to break the actin myosin cross bridges. Or you can say ATP binds to the myosin heads, which causes the myosin to detach from the actin. And then ATP is hydrolyzed to reset or bend the myosin head. It will basically, once, once the ATP binds to the myosin head, right, that causes the actin myosin cross bridge to break. And then the ATP is hydrolyzed, which releases the energy needed to reset or recock or bend the myosin head back to its original position. So myosin, oh, Spelt that wrong. Let me write that again. So myosin head can reattach to the actin. Okay. So I would learn these two statements. You might see kind of vaguer things on the mark scheme, like ATP is used for the power stroke, but I wouldn't use that because it might not be on the mark scheme. But if we can be more specific and say ATP is needed to break the actin myosin cross bridge, and then it's hydrolyzed to reset or bend or recock the myosin head, that's definitely gonna get us the marks. And obviously once we've reset the myosin head, it can then reattach to the actin. We can also say ATP is needed to actively 
transport the calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But just be a little bit careful with that one because that's obviously after contraction, isn't it? When the muscle fibre is going to relax. So read the question carefully. Does it want the role of the role of ATP um, during contraction or could you also include the role of ATP during relaxation of the muscle fibre, which is when you could incorporate this marking point? Guys, I hope you found that longer video useful. Um, I'm just going to go back quickly and just ask you, please, these are the most important notes, okay? So rather than me writing it out all again in one big story, you can go back through this video, you can pause it, and you can write down these steps. So we've got step one and two, step three and four, five, six, and seven. If you learn that story, you're going to be perfect. You're going to smash any question on the sliding filament theory in your exam.